is on the ILS, 25 left, slow, I know we're hitting. 25 heavy, I'll tell you, I'm at 25 left, I can line number two, following 10 feet heavy, Airbus 3, a mile farm. Okay, number two. What's going on guys, Flyby Simulations here and welcome back to another video in my Aircraft's Dissected series, where we delve into every switch, knob and display in the cockpit of the Zeebo Mod Boeing 737-800. In the previous video, we looked at the MCP, or Mode Control Panel, which houses all of the important autopilot and auto throttle related systems within the aircraft. In this episode, we're going to be finishing up our cockpit familiarization portion of this series by covering all of the miscellaneous knobs and switches that sit in front of the pilots, and we will be taking an in-depth look at the various engine indications on the upper and lower display units. Now, an important note. Normally, I always indicate the errors pointed out to me in the previous video, and here they are as usual, so you can pause the video and check them out if you so please. However, I would also like to explicitly address one of my other errors that was pointed out to me by multiple people here. Now, if you want to skip this and simply get to the meat of the video, skip to this point on screen over here. However, if you want to know the error and understand it, stick around to find out. So, several people pointed out to me that I made an error in reading the departure procedure at San Francisco, where I said that this constraint was 3,000 feet or below. However, it actually happens to be 3,000 feet or above. The concept I was trying to explain still applies, but it's my job as a content creator to dissuade you guys from learning the wrong thing, even if it is from me, so I put it in the video regardless. Anyways, now that we're done with the formalities, let's jump into the flight deck. Alright ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the flight deck of the Boeing 737-800. So, there isn't a lot of room for an introduction to these buttons, as I already mentioned they are miscellaneous in nature and cover a whole host of different aircraft functions. So without further ado, let's jump into it and cover these systems from left to right as usual. Starting at the very top, we have a proprietary Zeebo Mod EFB, or Electronic Flight Bag. This EFB can be used for a whole host of things in the sim, such as adjusting the aircraft's settings, connecting ground services such as the GPU or chocks, fueling up the plane, loading up the passengers, calculating takeoff and landing performance data, and much, much more. We'll take a much closer look at this at the start of the next episode, when we properly configure the aircraft from a cold and dark state, and I'll walk you through the various important settings you need to control before each flight. Coming below, we have the coffee holder for the pilot, obviously not simulated in the sim. Coming further right here, we have the captain's oxygen mask. If you remember from episode 2 of the series, the pilot's oxygen masks are very specialized, and are therefore stored here to be used in the event of a cabin depressurization. You can test the oxygen system and hear an audible ventilative sound when you press this button here, like so. Coming further right, we have these two light controlling knobs, out of which only this one is simulated in the Zeebo 737. This knob illuminates this area where this EFB is right now, as pilots can unhook their iPad and look at airport charts and such in this area instead. Finally, this last half arc wheel over here is what's known as the nose wheel tiller, which allows the pilots to control the orientation of the nose wheel when taxiing on the ground. Pilots would normally turn this wheel anti-clockwise to turn the nose wheel left, and vice versa. Coming to the center here, on the captain's side, we have a few more buttons, knobs, and indications to look at, starting with this master caution panel. There are three buttons here, starting with this red one, this is the main fire warning button, which lights up when a fire is detected on board the aircraft. Additionally, an audible alarm is also sounded throughout the aircraft like so. You can simply press this button to silence the alarm. Coming right next to this red switch, this is the master caution light, which lights up whenever there is a problem or fault with any system within the aircraft. This light is normally accompanied by an indication on this system annunciator panel, highlighting which system has a fault. For example, here we have a problem with the fuel, so the master caution light has lit up and the system annunciator simply says fuel. To dismiss this warning, simply press the master caution light and the warning goes away. However, this dismissal is only temporary, as the system annunciator also acts as its own button. If you dismiss the fuel warning by pressing the master caution light, 
Sure, the light goes away, but if you haven't managed to fix the problem and press this system enunciator button, it recalls the problem and lights up the master caution light again. Note that sometimes you might see the master caution light up, but no see nothing on the system enunciator. This is because the two master caution systems on either side of the flight deck control different systems, so make sure to check the other side and you'll find the problem. Coming further below, right next to this PFD, we have this digital clock, which allows pilots to see the current date as well as the time in local as well as Zulu measurements. Simply press this button to cycle between these modes. On the left, we have a chronometer switch, which allows pilots to time the duration of their flight. Pilots normally start this before takeoff and stop it after landing to measure their air time. Press the button once to start the chronometer, press it again to stop it, and press it one more time to reset it. Coming below here, we have an ET switch, which stands for estimated time. This is basically the same thing as the chronometer and allows pilots to track time. Press this ET button once to start the clock and press it again to stop it. You can also press this little reset button to reset the ET timer. Finally, these two buttons on the right simply allow pilots to adjust the brightness of this clock. Coming underneath, this guarded switch allows pilots to select the nose wheel steering setting between the normal and alternate modes. Alright, so moving up above the primary display units in front of the captain, on the left here we have this below glide slope inhibit switch. Basically, when pilots are hand flying an ILS approach with a glide slope indication to assist them, this light illuminates when the aircraft dips below the optimal vertical path to the runway and sounds an automated voice enunciating glide slope. In certain situations, when dipping below the glide slope is a planned maneuver, pilots can press this light to silence the automated voice, but the light will still persist. More information about what a glide slope is in the previous episode of this series, so go check that out if you haven't already. Moving further right, we have some knobs that allow you to reposition important displays within these panels. Now remember in episode 3 when I said that calling this outboard display unit the primary flight display was incorrect? Well, this is the reason, as pilots can use these two knobs to reposition the primary flight display in, let's say, the inboard display unit instead. Pilots normally do this not out of convenience, but when there is a problem with one of these screens and they must choose another panel to host these displays on. Coming to the right of these view switching knobs, we come to a few important indicator lights and buttons. Starting off at the top, this AP reset light comes on when the main autopilot command system has been disengaged and is accompanied by an alarm like so. You can simply push the main autopilot to disengage switch back up to disable the alarm as well as the light, or you may press this button itself, which accomplishes the same function. Coming to the right, there is a similar switch for the auto throttle system, but this one doesn't sound an alarm. Over to the right, this final light on this panel is the FMC message light, which comes on when there is a message on the flight management computer. We'll see more of this in the full flight episodes coming out after this video. This test button simply allows pilots to test system 1 and 2 to see if the lights are working properly. Coming further right, we have this main lights switch, which allows pilots to switch the intensity of the lights between bright and dim modes. Furthermore, flipping this switch up to this test position lights up every single light and bulb in the cockpit to allow pilots to see if every single light is operating properly. Coming further underneath, we have some more system-specific lights. Starting off at the left, we have this takeoff config light, which lights up along with an audible warning when the thrust levers are pushed to more than 74% without being prepared for takeoff. This means that either the flaps are not extended for takeoff or the speed brakes are armed. Basically, if the aircraft is not ready for takeoff and the pilots advance the thrust levers, this light will come on to alert the pilots to abort the takeoff and redo their checklists. Right next to this light is the cabin altitude light, which comes on when the pressure in the cabin exceeds 10,000 feet, thereby signifying a loss in cabin pressure. This is also accompanied by a warning bell, but I cover the pressurization systems in great depth in episode 1 of the series, so go check that video out for more information. 
Next to the cabin altitude light, we have two lights pertaining to the speed brake system. This top light, as mentioned in episode 2, shows when the speed brake levers have been set to the armed position. This bottom speed brake do not arm light comes on when there is a fault with the automatic deployment of the flight spoilers when the lever is set to the armed detent. Finally, the stab out of trim light comes on when the autopilot systems within the aircraft are unable to properly control the stabilizer trim system within the aircraft. More information about that in the second episode of this series. Finally, on the captain's side, we have a few more knobs that control the lighting in the aircraft. These are all hidden behind this yoke, so in order to access them with ease, a pro tip for you beginners out there is to press this yoke, which makes it disappear, and then you can manipulate these knobs with ease. So, starting off with this main panel light, this controls the backlighting of the captain's forward panels. Coming further right, this knob controls the brightness of the upper display unit, which we will take a detailed look at in a second. This next knob controls the background lighting in the flight deck, and this AFDS floodlight simply lights up the MCP panel we looked at in the previous episode. Underneath here, this knob on the left controls the brightness of the outboard display unit. This next knob controls the brightness of the inboard display unit, and finally this one controls the brightness of the lower display unit. So, pretty self-explanatory at the end of the day. Okay, so that brings us to the center of the forward panels, where we first have these two standby instrument displays that can be used during emergencies by pilots. So on top, you have the standby artificial horizon which, as you can probably see, is a miniature version of the PFD we looked at in detail in episode 3 of this series. This approach button on top brings up the appropriate scale ID enunciators to allow pilots to fly an approach onto a runway. Pressing this HP slash in button allows pilots to switch between hectopascals and inches of mercury to input the altimeter setting, which can also be done using this knob over here. Finally, these two buttons on the side allow pilots to adjust the brightness of this display. Finally, at the bottom, you also have this VOR slash ADF standby instrument at the bottom, which can provide radios to nearby VOR stations or ADF stations by using these two buttons to switch between the two. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to this upper display unit, which displays important engine and fuel-related information to the pilots. So we'll first take a look at the various indications on this panel before learning how to manipulate them using these selectors over here. So, starting off on the left here, we have this TAT indicator, which shows the total air temperature. Now note that this is different from outside air temperature. The total air temperature is the temperature of the air when it hits the aircraft at high speeds. The air gets compressed when it hits the airframe of the plane at these speeds and therefore heats up an effect known as RAM rise, and that number is depicted here in Celsius. On the right of this indication, we have the thrust mode setting, which has been selected. On the ground, this will often read TO, or takeoff, as this is normally the next phase of flight and pilots will set takeoff thrust during the takeoff sequence. Underneath these indications are the two N1 readouts for the two engines. Now N1 is the primary metric used to measure engine performance and thrust and is basically the percentage at which the fans or engine blades spin at. You can see how this percentage changes when I advance and retract the thrust levers. Moreover, on top here, we can see the N1 indication that has been set for the takeoff, in this case 98%, meaning that the engines will provide 98% thrust during takeoff. Coming down here, these two indications show the EGT, or exhaust gas temperature for the two engines, which is similar to the analog EGT gauge we saw for the APU in the first episode of the series. Underneath these indications, we see these FF indication, which stand for fuel flow, thereby indicating how much fuel is being used per hour by each engine. In this case, operating the engines at an idle speed of 19.5% N1, the fuel flow is 650 pounds per hour per engine. Coming to the top right here, this is a dedicated system enunciator for the engine display. 
These top two lights will light up and say start valve open, meaning that the bleed air valves are open to allow the engine to spool up to their idle speed during the engine start procedure. The next two indications will show filter bypass, which is similar to the fuel filter bypass lights on the overhead panel and will show if fuel is skipping its filtration process and is being injected directly into the engines. Finally, this last row will show low oil pressure indications, which is pretty self-explanatory. Finally, at the bottom here, we see the total fuel on board as well as the overall fuel distribution. We see how much fuel is in the left, right, and center tanks, and we also see the units in which the fuel is being measured. In this case, pounds. Okay, so now that we've taken a look at this display, let's see what these buttons and knobs do on top. Firstly, this knob over here allows pilots to set an N1 reference for the engines. By keeping it to auto, the thrust setting for takeoff or go around thrust will be calculated by the flight management computer depending on what is selected in the FMC when the pilots calculate the takeoff performance before the flight. We'll see how to do this in the FMC programming video of the series. Pilots can also set individual N1 thrust settings for each engine by using this knob at the back to choose between engine 1, engine 2, or both engines, and then using the smaller knob to select the specific N1 value. Coming to the right of this knob, we have a V-speed reference knob, which allows pilots to set important takeoff reference speeds on the PFD. Again, leaving this knob to auto allows pilots to use the FMC to program the V-speeds that are displayed on the speed tape during takeoff, but they may also use this larger knob to manually select a particular V-speed and then use the smaller knob to adjust the value for that V-speed. Now if you don't know what a V-speed is, I'll cover it in detail in the FMC programming video. Trust me, that is indeed going to be an important video. Finally, this fuel flow switch over here is spring-loaded and changes this fuel flow display on the upper display unit we were just looking at. When in this rate position, the display will show the rate at which fuel is used by both engines. When the switch is flicked down to this used position, the FF display will temporarily change to highlight how much fuel has been used so far by the aircraft and will eventually go back to the same fuel flow indications. Flicking the same switch up resets the fuel used indications back to zero. Pilots may do this before a flight to not have their fuel usage indications clash with any previous flights performed with the same aircraft. Alright, and that brings us to this lower display unit, which as you can see is normally left blank. However, it's pretty simple to display information on here using this MFD panel. By pressing this engine button once, you get access to all of this engine related information on this display. At the top, you have the N2 readout. Now, after researching a lot about the N2 readout, I must say that it is a hard concept for me to understand. However, from what I gathered, the N1 is an indication of the low pressure spool of the engines and therefore shows the speed of the fan blades as a percentage of total thrust. N2, on the other hand, is an indication of high pressure spool of the engines and is responsible for providing power to the aircraft. If there are any real world pilots in the comment section, please feel free to provide me with an explanation about what N2 is, as the viewers and I both will greatly appreciate it. Coming underneath, we have the fuel flow once again. Nothing new there. The next three indicators underneath all show information about the oil used in the engine core of the aircraft. So we have the oil pressure, the oil temperature, and the oil quantity at the bottom. Finally, at the very bottom, we have this VIB indicator, which shows the engine vibration inside the nacelle. These hatch marks on top indicate vibration thresholds, and if the engine is vibrating more than this amount, it may lead to engine failure or even structural damage, so this is a pretty important readout. Pressing this inch button again will bring a condensed version of the information we just saw on the lower display unit now onto the upper display unit without the visual indications. Finally, pressing the engine button once again deletes this information from both the display units and returns us back to our original state. Pressing the system button right next to the engine button shows some aircraft subsystem information on the lower display unit. 
Starting from the top, we see the hydraulic quantity and pressure of the hydraulic fluids in both hydraulic systems A and B, and pilots will normally check this to make sure they have enough before starting their flight. Coming underneath, we have the brake temperatures for the four main landing gear wheels. Underneath here, we have live readouts of the position of every movable flight control surface in the aircraft, including the elevators, the ailerons, the flight spoilers or speed brakes, as well as the rudder on the very bottom. Pilots will normally verify their full range of motion during a flight control check performed before every flight. Finally, the CR button is a cancel recall button, which is very similar to the system enunciator button we looked at previously. Pressing this button once allows pilots to recall any indications on the upper and lower display units, and pressing it again allows them to get rid of these indications. And that's that for this panel. Alright, let's move up here to these last few buttons and indications here to wrap up the center portion of the forward panels. Starting off with this knob over here, this is the auto brake knob, which controls the intensity of the braking performance provided by the landing gear of the aircraft upon landing. Pilots can select the appropriate braking performance all the way from 1, which offers mild braking performance, all the way to max for the most severe braking performance. The setting that the pilots select is based on different things, such as the condition of the runway, I mean if it is dry, wet, or slippery, as well as the runway length, presence of tailwind, etc. This RTO setting here stands for Rejected Takeoff, and pilots switch the auto brake setting to this mode before takeoff to allow the aircraft to provide maximum braking action if the pilots decide to abort the takeoff for any reason. This auto brake disarm light on top comes on when pilots switch over to manual braking after having landed to vacate the runway. We'll see this light being used during our full flight video. Underneath this is the anti-skid inoperative light, which as you probably guessed, comes on when the anti-skid system within the wheels is inoperative. Moving further right, we come to this analog gauge we looked at in episode 2 of the series, which shows the position of the flaps from 0 up to 40 degrees from the horizontal. This LE flaps transit light comes on when the leading edge flaps and slats are transitioning into position, and this green LE flaps extended light comes on when the flaps are locked into position. Coming further right, this big lever over here is the main landing gear lever. The lever itself has three distinct positions, up, down, and off. When switched to the down position, the hydraulic systems within the aircraft extend the main undercarriage of the aircraft and lock it in place to be able to absorb the impact of the aircraft's weight upon touchdown. This is highlighted by these three green lights on top. When the landing gear is pushed up, the hydraulic systems will retract the gear from its down position and will lock it in place inside the wheel well of the aircraft. When the landing gear is transitioning between positions, these three lights will come on as red lights and all lights will extinguish when the gear has been retracted successfully. Finally, this off position depressurizes the hydraulic systems that hold the gear in their position in the wheel well. Pilots normally switch the landing gear lever to this position a few minutes after takeoff, as once the gear is safely stowed within the wheel well, constant hydraulic pressure is not required to hold them there. Moving to this colorful analog gauge here shows the brake pressure within the landing gear of the aircraft. Any value between 3 to 3.5 means the brakes have good pressure and are sufficient for flight but a value in red means that there is too much brake pressure, and a value in yellow means that the pressure within the brakes is lacking. Again, pretty self-explanatory. Finally, we come to the first officer's side of emergency indications, which are identical to the captain's except for this indication right here. This speed brakes extended light comes on when the flight spoilers or speed brakes are extended at a time when they are not supposed to be for example, during takeoff or other such phases of flight. Finally, on the first officer's side, we have the main GPWS system, which stands for the Ground Proximity Warning System. This system is responsible for alerting pilots whenever the aircraft is getting anywhere close to the ground. 
This includes everything from the minimums enunciations when the aircraft is coming into land and is perfectly stabilized, all the way to unstabilized approaches, wind shears, flying into high terrain conditions, and so on. This light on top is an in-op light to signify a fault or failure with the GPWS system. Underneath this light is a GPWS test system, which tests the automated voices that sound in the cockpit during various different phases of flight. To hear what happens when I press this button, go to episode 3 where I show the GPWS system's effects on the PFD. Finally, these three guarded switches over here allow pilots to inhibit or turn off certain alarms in the cockpit relating to the flaps, the landing gear, and the terrain system. These are used when either the aircraft has a problem that the pilots are already aware of and don't want a constant alarm to distract them, or when they are flying special approaches into certain airports that have rather weird procedures. For example, if pilots are flying into a region with high terrain, knowing that they must avoid the terrain around them and having accounted for this, they can simply flip this cover and flick this switch up, thereby disabling any terrain-related voice commands from disturbing the pilots. Finally, on the right here are three knobs that allow the first officer to control his or her panel backlight on their side as well, as well as to control brightness of their inboard and outboard display units respectively. So, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of this aircraft's dissected episode, covering the miscellaneous switches that lie in front of the pilots on the forward panels. If you've stuck around so far, congratulations! You now have a sound understanding of how pilots can monitor different engine parameters and various subsystems in flight. Now, I must also mention that all of the documentation and websites I used to research for this video are linked down below in the description, including a written text version of this entire video, if you prefer to read those and understand more about this aircraft. That being said, the next episode in this series will be the start of our full flight portion of this series, where we will generate a flight plan using an external software called SimBrief and learn all about the important components within a standard operational flight plan. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to perform a full stop landing at the like button and the subscribe button and press the bell icon for future notifications from this channel. Also, be sure to fly by the comments section and let me know if there's any questions you'd like me to answer for you. As usual, thanks for flying by.